All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We are in a series of trying to understand what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And the great commission that I just read starts out with a very important phrase. And it's a very important phrase as we look at today's text. Is today's text is going to talk about the temptation of Jesus Christ. What do you think? Do you think Jesus was really tempted? And probably the, the, the other piece of that question is, do you, if he was really tempted, do you think he could have sinned? And I should warn you that theologians have debated this for quite some time. And there are a significant number of people who would say, oh no, he never could have sinned. Impossible for God to sin. I would simply say that my concern with that is if he couldn't sin, then how was it temptation? I mean, seriously, we're gonna look at some verses that say he was tempted in every way just like us. In every way? Okay, we're not going to let our minds wander on that one too much this morning. But the fact is, is that we're all tempted, right? The person who thinks they're not tempted? Wow, you are holy. Or you might be deceived. (laughs) Because there's things happening to every single one of us, right? I mean, there's temptations. Gentlemen, and several of you ladies, have you ever been tempted by porn? Oh my goodness, we have so much stuff on our computers today. The access to, to stuff that I don't even think God thought of decades ago is, is out there and it's rampant. Have you ever been tempted to that? Have you ever been tempted to eat too much? Have you ever been tempted to say something unkind to somebody else? Well, they deserved it, so I guess that's not temptation, right? Have, have you been tempted to be late? Well, you're more important than the other people, so it doesn't matter. H- have you been tempted to get frustrated with somebody? Have you been tempted to dislike your boss? Have you been tempted to dislike your neighbor? Have you been tempted to cuss or swear or say something that's really uh, not God-honoring? Have you been tempted to sleep when God's inviting you to worship him? What are your temptations? And and please, you don't need to stand up and tell us now. It would take us too long, right? (laughs) But every single person in this room, it's a fact. I'm certain of it. You're tempted. If you don't think you are, I can promise you you're tempted to lie. (laughs) Okay? So so we we all deal with this one. Was Jesus really tempted? Was he tempted in every way like us, like the word says? Well, we're going to look at Mark's version of temptation. So let's look there. And it's really, again, just a couple of verses. Um, You're going to notice that this is very different. For those of you who have read about the temptation of Jesus in Matthew and in Luke, you're going to see that this, this version of the temptation of Jesus is rather different because it's simple. In fact, it doesn't say much at all. In verse 12 of chapter 1 of Mark. At once, the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. There. That's the temptation story in Mark. Mark has a point, though, that he's trying to make, doesn't he? He's not trying to go into all the details of how Jesus was tempted. In fact, maybe one of the things he's really saying is is that Jesus was tempted the whole time he was out there. Do you see it? The whole time he's out there, Jesus is being tempted. Do you guys get a day off from temptation? Oh my goodness, I'm sitting over here and saying, oh Lord, help me, I'm right, being tempted right now. Right? Do you, do you ever get tempted to be critical? No, no, you see, that's not a temptation. That's just the ability to see right from wrong, right? And, and some of us can see more right in others than wrong or more wrong in others, right? And, you know, come on, come on. Temp- temptation, Jesus was being tempted all the time, so are we. 
And I am convinced that Jesus could have sinned. The good news is, the incredible news is, the unbelievable news is, he never did. Fully human. See, we sometimes don't totally grasp what this actually means. That God came in human form, and Philippians says he emptied himself, and he becomes the servant, and he literally takes away his divinity so that he needs the anointing of the Spirit. In fact, how do we know that? It's what we, have, we read just previous to this. Look back behind what I just read. What does it say? Jesus comes to John the Baptist, and John baptizes him. As we look at some of the other texts, Jesus, uh, John says, you know, hey, I shouldn't be baptizing you. John also says that he's been waiting to see the Spirit of God coming down from heaven like a dove and ascending on the Messiah. Did he know that Jesus was Messiah? Oh, he knew some things about him, but he doesn't know for certain that this is Messiah. It's not until he sees this event taking place at the baptism of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and anoint Jesus. Why did Jesus need to be anointed? He was God, right? But look at this. He left his divinity in heaven. He empties himself out. He takes on human form. He becomes a living human being without sin. You don't think he was tempted as a little kid? I mean, I was five years old in the market when I stole my first piece of candy. I didn't know I was stealing. I, it was there. I mean, it's, I think it's really wrong on the supermarket for having all that candy right in the front of the hands of the five-year-olds, right? I mean, it's our job to reach out and grab and touch and learn things, right? And if you see something you like, well, why not take it? I mean, they, they had a whole bunch. They didn't need them. And yes, I got in trouble and had to go back and say, I'm sorry for stealing. I'm sorry, Mom, I didn't know I was stealing. It just was a piece of candy right there in front of me. I wanted it. Was Jesus Jesus tempted as a child? Oh, no, I'm sure he was perfect, right? Can you imagine parenting the perfect child? There's something incredible that happens with the baptism of Jesus. Jesus is beginning his ministry. And the Holy Spirit comes down from heaven, first off for John the Baptist, so John knows, yes, this is the Messiah. This is the one I'm preparing all these people for. This is the one I'm calling them to repentance. I'm saying, you guys, you gotta confess your sins. You've gotta admit where you're at. You've got stuff going on in your life that needs cleansed. And you need to get ready because the Messiah's coming. Folks, I do think the Messiah is going to come back again, yes? Yes? Yes. Wouldn't it be wise for us to do some of the similar preparation that John asked of the people then? Repent, be baptized, identify with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and then start living more for him? America, would it be good if we did that? Jesus Christ knew no sin, 2 Corinthians 5.21. He never sinned according to 1 Peter 2.22 and Hebrews 4.15. He had no sin in him according to 1 John 3.5 and John 14.30. Yet he was tempted in every way that you and I have been tempted. And that's 1 John 2.6 and Hebrews 4.15, which we're going to look at in a moment. Folks, he was tempted physically, he was tempted emotionally, he was tempted spiritually, and he did not sin. Well, we need to look at some other pieces and then come back to this piece of it. But uh, I wonder, have you ever been driven to the wilderness? To a wilderness. Moses gets sent out to the wilderness after he murders a guy. And he runs and he's out there for 40 years. Elijah goes out to the wilderness. He's actually in a cave and he's crying out, I'm all alone, God help me. You look, there are times that the the leaders uh, that that really make a difference in the kingdom of God have had their moments of wilderness experiences. Even Billy Graham talks about his experience where he was questioning whether God really existed or not. Nailed at a stone down at Forest Home and made a choice that day to believe that Jesus was the son of the living God and decided to live for him and we all know the rest of the story. Have you had a wilderness experience? Notice when wilderness experiences oftentimes come. What has just happened to Jesus? 
God has spoken. His dad has spoken from heaven. This, you, not just this, you are my beloved son. I'm well pleased with you. Any of you wanted dad to say that for you? Some of us have had dads who didn't hear it and didn't know how to say it. It was end of, near the end of my dad's life when I finally realized my dad thought I was an okay pastor. But I still play back the tapes when I was told, you're going to end up a criminal, you're going to end up in jail. And I kept hearing that, you're no good. Some of us have a dad's like that. But what happens when a dad cries out from heaven, son, you're my beloved son. I'm pleased with you. You realize that's the way the father wants to speak to you. The father looks at you and to each one of us wants to say, you're beloved. You're my precious child. And I'm pleased with you. Well, darkness knows, so does God, that that's a moment of vulnerability too, isn't it? Because all of a sudden, we can get just a little bit prideful. And look what Mark says. Mark says that the Spirit drives Jesus out into the wilderness. Do you know what the wilderness represented for for the Jew? Something similar to the sea. The sea was the place of the monster of evil. That's why when Jesus walks on the water and calms the storm, he's showing he has power over evil. Well, the wilderness had a similar image for the Jew as well. It was the place where the devil lurked. It was a place of darkness, a place of danger. Well, of course, there are wild animals out there and things like that, and there could be robbers and all that, but the wilderness had this representation of evil. And Jesus is sent by the Holy Spirit to go out into the wilderness when right after he's had this incredible affirmation. Folks, this is 30 years that he's been living on the earth in this human body, confined to that body. Unbelievable how he does this. That God limits himself even with time, places him in this human body, and has him living as a human being, experiencing all the pressures and challenges of humanity, and now gives him this moment where he says, "I'm, I'm obeying you, Father. And he gets baptized. Not because he had sinned, not because he needed it, not because he needed to repent, but simply because he's starting his ministry and saying, I'm going to follow you now. I'm obeying you, Father. I'm ready to run down that road of humility and sacrifice, and I know at the end of it's a cross waiting for me. And I'm going to obey. And God says, yeah, that's my beloved son. Oh, son, I am pleased with you. And the Spirit of God, heaven literally cracks open. And the Spirit of God comes down and in the form of a dove. Not an eagle, not a raven, but a dove. And lands on Jesus. And the Spirit anoints him. And the Spirit will stay with him and will empower him to do the ministry that he's going to do for the next three years and walk with him as he goes to the cross. Have you been driven to the wilderness? No temptation has overcome you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Some of us are tempted by images. That's what pornography is about. Some of us are tempted by knowledge. Oh, we're going to just get to know more and more and become smarter and more significant. Some of us are tempted by feelings. Emotions get a hold of us and we, we, we follow after them. Some of us are tempted by ego. What are you tempted by? No temptation has overcome you, Paul says. That is not common to man, but God is faithful. He will provide a way out for you. When you're in the middle of that temptation, he's going to say, look here. 
I know you're tempted. I know what it's feeling like. I know what you're thinking right now. Follow me. There's a way out of this. And he offers that way out. Wilderness experiences are dangerous places, aren't they? But they're also incredible moments. Wilderness times in our life are times that God can speak to us because we get away from the noise. We get away from the activity. Yes, we're vulnerable. We're we're vulnerable to the dangers that are out there. But God himself wants to visit us. And that's what he's doing even here for his son. He's taking him to the wilderness. And he's actually preparing him for a much bigger battle. Folks, do you think he was tempted to not go on that cross? We look at the story of Gethsemane. And as he's moving towards Gethsemane and he's told Judas, man, go. Do what you gotta do. He's broken. And he heads out to that hillside and those olive trees and he says, okay guys, here you sit here and pray. And pray hard. Pray hard because I am, I am in anguish like I've never been in before. Pray for me and pray for yourselves because we're in trouble. And he goes off, he leaves three closer and he goes off by himself. Another wilderness moment and he prays. And he comes back and they're all asleep because they're human and they're worn out. And he wakes them up and you guys, this is a really, really, really dangerous night. This is really a hard time for me. Please, please don't fall asleep. Please pray. And, and again, guys, you better be praying for yourselves because you don't realize how much you're about, and he said it earlier to Peter, how much you're about to be sifted. You don't know the trial you're about to face. It's a wilderness moment. And so Jesus is being prepared for that wilderness. Jesus is being prepared for the battle. And Satan's going to come to him and Satan's going to attack him. And God knew that Jesus needed this preparation to get him ready because the temptation was going to be much worse down the road. Satan tempted Jesus when he was weakest. Do you see what happens? It says that he's out there for 40 days. Some of us have fasted for a week. Some of us have done even a Daniel fast for 30 days. Had no meat, no sugar, no sweets. Just, just un- unless you had, um, what, coffee bean? Had no coffee even. Right? And took that whole time to really try to focus and praying on God. Have you ever done any kind of an extended fast? You know, that, sometimes just even that very first missing of the very first meal, you start to feel like you're going to get sick. And the hunger pains can, can really get to you. And, and then that can happen for several days, can it? Until the, and here's the one challenge is, as you go on in a fast, you can start to get totally weak. Physically, emotionally, in all ways. You can even get a little weird, I should warn you. <laughs> okay? Especially if you're going to do a 40-day fast. This is, a, this, this is something that's really, really hard. You've got to be really wise and better be something that God told you to do. And there are a few in Scripture that we hear about doing that. Well, Jesus is being tempted when he's weakest. And I say weakest, why? Because he's out in the wilderness, he's out with the animals, he's out there not eating, he's physically being drained, he's out there where it's hard, it's dangerous, it's tough, and he's weakest because he's just been exalted. And, the, and you're gonna see this, what Satan comes, that the core of what Satan wants Jesus to do is not humble himself. Don't follow the road of humility, Jesus. And you're going to see that in the temptations and when we get there in a moment. But Satan wants to tempt Jesus when he's weak. David Leggy says, the interesting thing about the temptation was that the temptation was a, never a temptation for him to give up his sovereignty. It was never a temptation to give up his royalty, if you will. It was never a temptation for him to give up his rights and his privileges and his honor and his exaltation and his elevation. It was a a temptation for him to abandon the humiliation. Philippians 2, 5 to 8 says, Have this mind among yourselves, which was yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He what? Humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death 
on a cross. If you read Matthew 4, the first part of the chapter, Luke 4, the first part of the chapter, the temptation's there. First one, you're hungry, turn those stones into bread. Satan says, you're the son of God, you're the king, you're, you're God the son, you're the anointed one, you're the Messiah. And Satan affirms, you're privileged, you should have honor, you should have respect, Jesus, you should not hunger. Don't accept this humiliation. Someone said all the appeals were for him to take what was rightly given to him at his baptism, the honor, the authority, the dignity, the exaltation, and hold on to it and to abandon his humiliation. If you look at Matthew or, or at Luke, you'll see that what was the first temptation? <laughs> Jesus, you're a little bit hungry? Uh, look here. Jesus got bread. Right? In fact, it's a stone. I know it looks like, a, but it, doesn't it look like bread? Think about it. It's fresh. It's a stone, but you take and you turn that stone into bread and eat it. Come on, think about it, Jesus. Fresh baked bread. Remember when mom made it for you? Come on, Jesus. It's just a little bread and a stone. Just, you know, come on. Turn it into something that will meet your needs, Jesus. Doesn't it sound harmless? I mean, how can bread be a sin? And, I mean, nobody's there watching, so there's no ego involved, right? It's just turn the rock into bread. Yeah, follow this. Don't humble yourself. And what, in a sense, do you know what Jesus says? Well, he doesn't actually say this, but something like this. It's better to starve than to be fed apart from the will of the Father. For, for Jesus, I gotta do the will of God. That's what matters to me. And that's what feeds me. What's the second temptation? Hey, Jesus, come on, let's go flying. And they leave the wilderness and he takes him up to the top of the temple and he says, okay, Jesus, really? You, you, you say you're the son of God? Jump. Prove it. Because I'm sure if you jump, if you really have faith, the angels are going to catch you and you'll be fine. Just, but just jump. Hmm. It's interesting. Watch what Satan does and what Jesus does. How does Jesus respond to temptation? With the word of God. He quotes Deuteronomy. Three different places from Deuteronomy that he quotes as he's responding to the temptation. What does Satan do? misquotes the word of God. He takes the word of God, but he twists it a little bit, so watch out if that's what you do. So he takes Psalm 91, and he, and he leaves out the phrase, to guard you in all your ways. He misquotes the text. He says, he shall give his angels charge over you. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone, but it will guard you in all your ways. Meaning, he, look, Jesus, this is about your righteousness and I can't have you be righteous so I'm going to leave that part out of it. And Jesus says, don't put your God to the test. God doesn't appreciate being tested, does he? God expects obedience, not mental gymnastics. What's the third temptation? Now they go higher. <laughs> they go up onto a high mountain. Which one was it? Don't know. There's a couple of them around Jerusalem area takes him up on the mountain and Satan says, here you go. I want you to look here. This is all mine. Oh, I can't imagine what Jesus is feeling as he's going through this. <laughs> this is all mine and it can be yours. Just bow down. Look here, like this. Here, let me show you. There you go, we did it. Just do it, do it to me. It's simple, it's fast, it's quick. I'm going to tell you, Jesus, it's going to be a lot faster and a lot easier than hanging on that cross in a short time. So just kneel here. And, and you can have everything you want. Isn't that what you want? At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So look, if you bow to me, I'll give that to you. Simple, easy. Avoid the humiliation. Avoid the hard stuff.
It's a shortcut, isn't it? A way to get to what Satan thinks Jesus wants without doing the hard work. Folks, Mark wants us to understand that from the time Jesus left the baptism, he was being tempted and being tempted continually, nonstop. And isn't that a little bit what happens to us? The, t- temp- the temptation's going on all the time. At, at the times that you least expect it or when you think you're doing the best, all of a sudden, you know, boom, there comes that thought. Where did that come from? Especially, I'm at church. I'm not supposed to have thoughts like that. Where, what's that doing here? And, 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 temptation is constant and Jesus is experiencing that temptation. It's a continual temptation as he's out there in the wilderness being attacked by Satan. By the way, how did Jesus respond to the third temptation? It, he responds again with the word of God, doesn't he? And what does is, what is Psalm 1911 say for us? Memorize it, kids. Your word have I hid in my heart that I will not sin against you. Whatever translation you want to get that in, it says the same thing. If you'll take the word of God and put it inside here, not just out there, not just carrying it in your book or your phone, but you'll put it inside you, It'll come back out. It'll be a part of that finding that way out of the temptation that Jesus is going to show you away, away, away. Hebrews 4, 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Praise be to God. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Ray Stedman says, Mark suggests what other writers do not. That all through this 40-day period, he was tempted by the devil. In other words, the devil came to try him out in every possible way. Body, soul, spirit. He probed and assaulted and sifted and scrutinized and assailed him and bombarded him with every thought and every temptation that we human beings are subject to. When you read the other accounts, you can see that Matthew and Luke gather up the final temptations, the final mighty tests, because that's what Matthew and Luke will say. At the end of the 40 days, Satan comes again. And now he lays the heavy stuff on him. He's been whooping him for 40 days. Now he's going to try to really knock him down. But these indicate the nature of the test which came throughout this entire 40-day period. Devised by the master tempter of all, the one who knows how to find the weakness in our hearts, who knows how to get us and upset us. Jesus was tempted continually, aren't we? So when we're tempted, here's what we need to understand. Do you remember what happened at the baptism? Not only did God the Father speak, but God the Holy Spirit came and anointed Jesus. And who led Jesus into the wilderness? The Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. And who's with Jesus in the wilderness while he's being tempted? The Holy Spirit. And what has Jesus taken with him? His U version from the the Bible app. He's taken Deuteronomy along with him, hasn't he? He's taken the messages that Moses gave before the children of Israel went into the promised land. And he's quoting those messages back to Satan. And it's the word, the living word of God that's sharper than any two-edged sword that cuts deep to bone and marrow, that's inspired, that's God-breathed, that is inside of Jesus because he is the living word. And that word is what's giving him strength with the power of the Holy Spirit to do what? Say, Satan... Okay, you've had your fun. Goodbye. And he takes the way out that the word and the Holy Spirit gives to him. And Jesus, though he's continually tempted, finds his way away from it. When we are tempted, folks, we're not alone. We're not alone. The spirit of God is with us. Did you see what also the, Mark also said? While Jesus is out there, what's happening? He's with the wild animals. But it doesn't say they're beating him up. It's, it almost appears more like he's kind of enjoying them. I don't know, I don't know, maybe was he, was he petting a bear? I don't know, it'd be kind of fun, wouldn't it? 
a cub with mom a long ways away. <laughs> He's out there with wild animals, but better still, the Holy Spirit's with him, and what or who el- angels are with him? Angels are ministering to him. Isn't that interesting? That's some of the things that Satan was even trying to say. Hey, throw yourself down. The angels will pick you up. That's what they say while he's hanging on the cross. Call the angels and tell them to destroy these people and come down off the cross if you're really the Messiah. And the temptation was there all throughout because Jesus sees the angels like we don't. And he knows they're there and they're ministering to him. And doesn't scripture say we have the angels also helping us? Remember the story of Daniel? He's, he's waiting for, for God to come and bring him a message. And, 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 the, and the prophet, he comes to him and he says, look, I couldn't, the angel comes and says, I couldn't come. I couldn't get here to talk to you, to help you. Why? Because I was being held back by the prince over Persia. But the angel Michael came and fought. And by the power of that angel, the two of us have made it here to bring you this message, Daniel. Folks, God provides incredible supernatural resources to help us defeat temptation. Hebrews chapter 2, 17 and 18. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation. That means to take away sins for the sins of the people. Propitiation means you actually get, you take care of the responsibility. You clean them up and you remove it. And, and for because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Because he was tempted, understands temptation, he's able to help people who are being tempted. And Mark 1.13 says, and the angels were ministering to him. Matthew 4.11, then the devil left him and behold, angels came to him. The word minister is a word that means to, like serving food. We're going to have a meal afterwards. Uh, incidentally, if you're a guest with us today, please stay for food. Now, we're not going to break your arm if you try to leave, but, but, but there's something that happens in the ministry of serving food to one another. That's why the table, isn't it? It's this reminder of Christ's body, which is broken. And, and so we come to the table and, and we eat and, and we remember and we, we serve and we, we are served. And, and Jesus is showing us a, this, this importance of him ministering to us. And the spirit of God's been ministering to Jesus as he's out there under the temptation. And, and now he will minister to us when we're being tempted. Because here's the thing. We have the same Holy Spirit that Jesus did. Sometimes we think that simply because Jesus was God, that's why he was able to avoid temptation. No, the fact is Jesus was human. But he allowed the Spirit of God to help him. And you have that same Holy Spirit. If you believe that Jesus died on that cross and rose from the dead for you, then that same Holy Spirit has come to dwell within you. The spirit of God, the spirit of life is available to you. The resources that helped Jesus are available to you. And not only do we have the same spirit, but we've got the same word. In fact, we probably have a few extra words, (laughs) don't we? (laughs) We have things that Jesus didn't have. He knew that was coming because he's the beginning and the end. He's the alpha and the omega. He's been there from from yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so he, the word was already in him, but we've got all this stuff that Paul and the apostles also added. And the, this living word that helps us, are we using it? Are we allowing the spirit to help us when we're tempted? Mark 1.10 says he was filled with the spirit and he was filled with the word of God. And so what does he use? He quotes Deuteronomy 8.3, Deuteronomy 6.16, and Deuteronomy 6.13. For he has this word that's gonna help him to defeat evil. See, it's the spirit of God that gives him the ability to stand firm. It's the word of God that gives him the ammunition to defend himself against the target, the darts of evil. I don't remember who said it, but somebody said, if we want to be successful in our battle with the flesh and the devil, we need to be sure that we are living lives that are controlled by the Spirit of God, Ephesians 5.18, and filled with the Word of God, Psalm 119.11. 
We need him and his power if we are going to have the victory in our own times of testing. There's one last thought about this text that I think is significant. Effective ministry is done by those who triumph over temptation. What do I mean? That if you're really going to honor God, if you're really going to serve him well, and you're going to do really effective ministry that's going to make a difference in people's lives, you'll be most effective when you're able to be victorious over temptation. And the other side of that is true as well. If you want to serve God, Satan's going to try to tempt you and put things in your path and cause you to be in a place so that you're going to fall and not on the night before going to the cross. He says, I'm I'm coming back at a time when you're weak again and I'll tempt you. Do you remember what what Jesus asked the disciples? Which, what do you say, who do you say that I am? Peter declares, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus is, wow, that's come from the Holy Spirit, Peter. (laughs) That wasn't man in you. Thank you. All right, so Peter, with that declaration, come on, let's go to Jerusalem and I'm going to die. What? No, we're not going to Jerusalem, Jesus. Not going to allow that. You're not going there. Not going to allow you to die. I'm going to stand up for you and we're going to stay away from that place. And what does Jesus say next? Get behind me, Satan. In our highs, they are also our dangerous and most vulnerable moments. Satan comes again. What does he say? He's washing their feet because nobody else was humble enough to do it. Well, they all came as important people, right? Not servants. And so he gets down and he washes their feet. This is the night he's going to be betrayed and he even washes Judas' feet. And after washing their feet, he says, okay, now go and do the same thing. And it won't be long till he says, but you know, guys, this is getting so hard for me and it was really tough to wash Judas' feet. He doesn't say that out loud, but that it was. And one of you is going to betray me. And they have that great chorus, you know, is it I, is it I, is it I, is it I? And, you know, they're all thinking, oh, you know, it's not me, but, you know, I, just, I need to join the chorus. So, is it I? Eventually, Judas will be released. And Jesus will look at Peter again and say, Peter, I know you're a brave man. I know you've honored me well, but um, you're, you're going to deny me. Oh, no, not me. It's Jesus. Excuse me, Peter, Peter. Satan is wanting to sift you like wheat. And Satan came back again, didn't he? And they go to that garden, and Jesus has that prayer. And now in his weakest most trying moment because the cross is looming in the dark. And it's deeper than the cross, folks. It's deeper than the physical pain. It's about being separated from God the Father. It's about becoming sin. He who had never sinned, who never touched it, is now not just going to get dirty, he's going to become it. He himself is going to become sin. And God's going to reject him because of it. And he's going to die. And in that anguish and thinking about that, Satan comes to him. And Satan comes when he's hanging there on that cross and he's already been whipped and tortured and beaten and abused and he's suffering physically and emotionally. And he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Not because he doesn't know the answer, but because the pain is greatest. The spiritual anguish is there. It's ripping him apart. And Satan's the one coming to him one more time. And to beat Satan, what does he have to do? He says, into your hands, Father, I commit my spirit. How do you even do that when you're hanging there? You can't even move. But here you go, Father. I trust you. I'm not going to trust the one that's trying to rip me off of here. 
And he said, it's, it's finished. Yeah, Satan comes back, folks. And he comes, or at least one of his minions. Most of us, frankly, are never going to deal with Satan. But with one of his minions. Or worse yet, folks, and this is the thing we need to admit. We're tempted because of our own inner pains, hunger, desires, sin. We don't, frankly, even need Satan to be tempted. It happens just because of who we are. And so as you come to the communion table today, we're going to do a song before we, we go to the table. I believe it's called, Lord, I Need You. Worship team, why don't you please come? I want to ask you, please take these next few moments. This is one of those moments to be honest with God, not nudge your neighbor. Okay? This is also one of those moments not to move around. This is not time to get the, the lunch ready. It'll happen when we need it. Okay? This is a time for you to be very honest with Jesus Christ.